Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 9, or Dry Dock 9 from Outer Space. Anyway, we kick off with a question from Napalm Ratta who asks, How important is the superstructure of a ship? What is its purpose except for fire control and housing the bridge dash lookout? Couldn't have it have been hidden inside the ship and less superstructure like some of the designs of Soviet battleships? Uh, are looking compared to other ships with massive superstructures. Well, as he points out, a lot of earlier battleships did actually have very limited superstructures, and initially, yes, they pretty much were just for command and control, uh, i.e. the bridge, the lookouts, and fire control systems. Mainly as a way of just giving them the height to be able to see an appropriate distance, and also to carry them clear of things like funnel smoke and such. However, as technology advanced, there was more and more things you needed to fit into a ship's hull, and the ships just didn't grow as quickly as the amount of technology that was needed to put in them grew. So initially you have things like the ship's boats, and then you need the cranes for those boats, and then later on you have uh, ship-launched aircraft, things like that. But as more and more space in the ship's hull gets taken up by more and more heavy technology, so you're talking about things like extra electrical generators for all the extra power that's needed, um, ammunition and such for the magazines for the secondary battery, the secondary battery itself, obviously the primary magazines and shell rooms and the barbettes for the main armament, uh, the engines, and obviously bear in mind as ships get faster, they need proportionally more space devoted to those engines and the boilers associated with them, plus the funnel uptakes, etc., all this space starts being used up very quickly and a lot of it is used for heavy equipment because obviously you want to keep the heavy equipment as low in the ship as you can. Now that means that a lot of stuff that is relatively light, things like ship stores, um, cabins, that kind of thing, are effectively forced out of the hull. And this is dictated in large part because, especially on things like battleships where you have an armoured citadel, there's a lot of very expensive, very important equipment that you need to keep under that citadel, which occupies the vast majority of the hull volume, and things like cabins and galleys and storerooms don't really come under that critical heading. So as ships get more and more technologically advanced and there's more and more competition for that citadel space, it means things like the aforementioned cabins, storerooms, etc., galleys, uh, need to be above the main deck and of course you can't have them just out on deck in the middle of nowhere so you put superstructure up around them. They're relatively light, they don't compromise much and ultimately the crew isn't going to be in its galley or having dinner or in the captain's not going to be in his cabin etc when battle starts so you don't have to armour them too much because the worst case scenario if you take a shell to that kind of part of your superstructure is oh well the captain's wine collection got blown up that might be a tragedy for him, but it's not a tragedy for the ship in battle. And so by the time you get to World War II, a lot of ships have this kind, of, these kind of facilities built into their superstructures alongside the uh, more critical things like fire control equipment and the bridge. And of course, as ships get refitted and more equipment gets added to them, especially during World War II, uh, there just isn't any space underneath the deck because if there was space there it would have already been used so you end up with more superstructure being added on to accommodate the needs of all these extra additions especially the extra crew necessary to man the large numbers of small and medium caliber anti-aircraft guns that a lot of ships had added to them during the war. Donald Palmrose says because I grew up in Oregon and served in the US Navy, I've been very interested in the history of the pre-dreadnought battleship USS Oregon. How she came to an end was a great travesty of preserving history. One aspect that has not been clear to me is that with all the supposedly public outcry to keep her intact, who was pushing in the Roosevelt administration to have her scrapped? Not sure you can research this out, but it would be great if you can shed some light on this. Well, it's true, this is actually quite a difficult thing to research. I have found some traces of records that potentially would explain it in more detail. Unfortunately, to do that, I would either have to be a US citizen or physically travel to the United States, which um, unfortunately isn't happening anytime soon. But from the publicly available records that I can get hold of, what it seems to be is that, as you're probably aware, the Oregon was loaned uh, to the public as a museum ship in the 1920s after the Washington Naval Treaty uh, demanded that she be rendered un incapable of warlike service, and she was quite happily a museum ship during the 1920s and 1930s. 
However, with America's entry into World War II after the Pearl Harbor attacks, it appears the cold hand of bureaucracy overtook her because the uh, the bureaucratic arm of the U.S. Navy took a look at its list of assets, which technically Oregon still was because it was only on loan, and having just lost a major portion of their battleship fleet, the U.S. Navy was desperate to find every last bit of funding and scrap it could get its hands on, and effectively just took almost anything they had that wasn't immediately war capable and sold it off in order to get money and possibly some other form of return out of it to fund the crash program that they needed both to expand the fleet to wartime size and to hopefully pay for the salvage repairs and replacements for all the ships they'd lost at the Pearl Harbor attack. And Oregon, unfortunately, just showed up on that list as a vessel unfit for warlike service that the US Navy still owned. It might be worth a bit of a scrap and some paper-pushing bureaucrat, is the best way I can put it politely, um, somewhere up in an office, decided that the ship's scrap value was worth more to him at that moment to balance his books than the ship's historical value was as a museum, and so off to the scrapyard the ship was sent. Now, last time I promised you a question from Distant Gondolin, so Glorfindel of Gondolin asks, if Canada had ever built a battleship, what do you think it would have been called, and in what role do you think they would have tailored the vessel? Uh, I know it's all purely speculation, but let's just assume the Canadian government had the time and resources for building it. I'll let you specify the time period. Enjoy. Well, the closest this actually came to happening historically was a bill that the Canadian government presented shortly before World War I, where they were going to pay for three Queen Elizabeth-class battleships for the Royal Navy. Now, that was defeated in the Canadian Parliament as being too expensive, Although, ironically, a battleship taken over that was under construction in British shipyards was then named HMS Canada and served during World War I. So, I think realistically, this is probably the point at which a Canadian government might have decided to build its own battleship. Since during this time period, you also had the Australian government paying for HMAS Australia, which was, of course, a modified Invincible class battlecruiser. Now, given that they're paying for a one-off battleship, they probably want to specialise it a little bit, and I can see this going one of two ways. Firstly, there's the original Queen Elizabeth class design, which was effectively a much enlarged version of the Iron Duke, complete with five twin turrets, so you would have had ten 15-inch guns with the fifth twin turret in the Q position amidships. Now, that would have been a very interesting one, because they... In theory, that ship should have been as fast as a Queen Elizabeth, so sort of 25 knots, um, but with much heavier armament and uh, similar armour, so that would have been a real sort of flagship unit. It would have been the most powerful battleship afloat at the time. Alternatively, there is what would have been the original HMS Agincourt, which was apparently supposed to be a Queen Elizabeth class battleship, but with its armour trimmed down and save enough weight in order to allow it to reach the same speed as the battlecruiser HMS Tiger, so it's got a halfway house on the way to HMS Hood. And So that would have been a fast, heavily armed battlecruiser, again, the most heavily armed battlecruiser in the world at the time. Now, of the two, with the various British battlecruisers coming off the line and outnumbering German battlecruisers quite significantly, I think the Canadian government, if they were given a choice between those two, probably would have gone with the former one. So, given its one-off status, I think it probably would have been called HMS Canada still, and its armament and armour would have been along the lines of a 25-knot battleship with 10 15-inch guns in five twin turrets. So you'd have a pair super-firing forward, a pair super-firing aft, and one Q turret amidships. It would have had a secondary battery of about 16 tw uh, 6 inch guns, 13.5 inch armour belt, probably on the more simplified layout of the R class rather than the rather complex Queen Elizabeth layout. And given that it would have needed to serve in Canadian waters, probably with a heavily strengthened bow to deal with ice and other such uh, slight issues that are common in northern Canadian waters. Such a ship would have been a suitably powerful flagship for the Royal Canadian Navy uh, at the time of its launch and probably well into the uh, 1920s, 1930s, it would have been able to take on and win against almost any battleship afloat. 
and in World War One, it probably would have been seconded to the Grand Fleet, where I suspect it would have been put in the lead of Fifth Battle Squadron, leading the Queen Elizabeth class. So it would have been heavily involved in the fighting at Jutland, and you never know, with that bit of extra firepower on hand, it might even have tipped the balance during the battle with Admiral Hipper in the Battle of the Battle Cruisers at the start of Jutland. Cambrian Privateer asks, what if Spain decided to go war with the British over the Falklands in 1770, despite not having French support? Well, this is a rather interesting a little point in history, as it sits nicely between the Seven Years' War and the outbreak of the American War of Independence. But I think when you look at the historical timeline, when Spain tried to take over the Falklands, they backed down fairly rapidly and handed it over to the British because they realised that without allies they weren't going to win any war with them. So if they decided that national pride and honour was greater than common sense and gone to war, then I think the British probably would have uh, rolled over them fairly quickly and easily. I mean, you're talking about a period where a few years down the line, when France and Spain are combined, uh, they're not able to overcome the British at sea, and this is going to be almost entirely a sea war. However, the most interesting effect here is possibly actually the effect on the American Revolution or the American War of Independence. And it could go one of two ways. One would be a little bit more war means uh, the debt that Britain has incurred fighting these wars goes up, which means they try and recover even more money from the American colonies, uh, which could exacerbate the American War of Independence and cause it to flare up sooner dash more violently. Alternatively, with Spanish shipping to hunt and some of the Spanish territories in the southern and southwestern parts of America to go after, it might distract the American colonists and give them something else to think about for a while, which might actually forestall the American Revolution, at least at that period. But either way, I can't see the war lasting more than a year or two before the Spanish fleet and merchant marine is driven from the seas and they're forced to sue for peace, which is pretty much what they thought was going to happen anyway, which is why historically they decided to give up the, their claims to the Falklands. Tarun01 asks, Did Britain build tribal class destroyers only for Canada? The answer to that is no. I mean, obviously they built tribal class for themselves as well, um, but they also built some tribal class for the Royal Australian Navy, uh, and those went on to serve during the war. And I suspect that had anyone else bothered to ask, they probably would have built them for anyone else. They seemed to quite like exporting destroyers in the 1930s. Um, but no, there you go. Tribal class destroyer operators, Canada, Australia, and of course, Britain. Viridian Toast asks, what if the Japanese had actually managed to hit the fuel depots at Pearl Harbor with bombers during the attack, and how would they have managed to do this? Well, surprising as it might sound to anyone with a modicum of understanding of naval strategy, the Japanese didn't actually rate those oil um, supplies as a particularly high priority target, so... Uh, that's why they didn't go for them in the first place, even though strategically the loss of that fuel depot would have been a significantly greater blow to the American Navy than the loss of things like the Arizona. Now, as for plausibly how they might have done it, well, the Japanese did have a third wave of craft ready to go that was called off because uh, the Admiral in charge thought that they'd done enough damage, and uh, that was that. So let's say in theory the third wave takes off, and let's assume that somewhat ahistorically they they reckon, well they decide that shall we say that they've done enough damage to the US battle line they can't find any carriers so they're just going to go after targets of opportunity and they just happen to decide that targets of opportunity include the oil farms now they could quite easily do this because obviously large amounts of oil are very flammable so throwing large amounts of explosives at them tends to result in very big booms and then you have hundreds of thousands of litres of burning fuel oil everywhere, which is just going to make things much, much worse. So the attack would be highly likely to be successful, um, if they went after in the first place, obviously. However, the Americans were kind of clued in that the Japanese were attacking by this point, and they had the anti-aircraft defences, uh, such as had survived, up to pretty much full alert. They had some more fighters uh, ready to go, and they certainly would have um, been aware of another attack needing a maximum force to try and repel it. So the Japanese would have probably taken significantly greater losses in the third wave than they did in the first and second waves. Uh, 
So that potentially has knock-on effects to their campaign further down the line because obviously the Japanese weakness was a relatively small pool of highly trained pilots. So if they lose a bunch of them right at the start of the war, this could potentially impact their effectiveness in other battles later on. Conversely, with the fuel farm destroyed and the incident damage that would have resulted from the spread of the burning uh, fuel, it's highly unlikely that the Americans could have sustained the relatively high pace of operations with their carriers and surviving other ships that they historically did after Pearl Harbor. Um, in fact, they may actually have to pull some of their ships back to the western coast of the United States until they can deal with rebuilding and restocking Pearl Harbor. So that could potentially delay the US offensives um, by several months, possibly longer, which would in theory give the Japanese fleet more of a chance to establish itself and its holdings in the western Pacific. And that would therefore make it harder for the American ships when they come back to actually um, restart retaking islands. The flip side to that, of course, is that American carrier efforts were kind of split and divided in the early months of the war because they were trying to do everything with just what they had at the time, and as a result, some of their ships were lost, some of the carriers. Um, this kind of delay, where they're forced to pull back and build up force whilst they are repairing and restocking Pearl Harbor, might actually mean that when the American ships do sail out, they actually sail out in significantly greater force in one task force than they did historically in 1942 and early 1943, which could lead to a really big showdown with the Japanese Navy um, much earlier than historically happened and obviously that could go either way um, the Japanese in theory at that point would still have a fairly large core of experienced pilots um, but the Americans would be engaging in far larger numbers than they did so who knows how that would go or even where that fight would be the new IKB 4472 says in a related question, um, what if the American carriers were caught by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor with some of the battleships surviving um, by being out on the fleet exercise, I kind of a swap around, how would the war play out with the US having to rely on battleships until they can repair or replace their carriers? The answer to that is basically one of two ways. I mean, the Americans, having taken those kind of losses, would be unlikely to sortie their ships um, over towards the Japanese-held areas, um, but it's always possible political pressure might have forced them to do so. I think basically what it come, is going to come down to is, do they manage to get their fleet together, and are they forced to sortie before or after Force said is attacked? Because from a strategic point of view, the thing that I suspect most of the US admirals would be saying is, OK, well, if you've taken these kind of losses, we need to just kind of hold the line beyond the range of their carriers, I Pearl Harbor, maybe a little bit further west until we can actually build replacement carriers. And then eventually, obviously, the Essex class will come out, um, carriers get redirected from the Atlantic and everything sort of goes down roughly the way it did, only with a year or two delay. However, if there is the kind of political pressure saying, no, you need to strike back and you need to strike back now, kind of like the stuff that led to the Doolittle raid, and the Americans send either unsupported or near unescorted um, battleships over to maybe, say, defend the Philippines, well, as I've already mentioned, force said kind of shows what happens when you do that, and that could lead to an even greater disaster as uh, American battleships are picked off by the Japanese aircraft and probably destroyers as well, because this is basically um, playing right into the Japanese playbook of provoking a weakened American force into sailing across without much escort cover to be taken on by the combined air and destroyer torpedo for attacks before being whittled down and taken out by the Japanese battle line. Um, which is why the American admirals, vaguely aware of that that was the Japanese idea, didn't really didn't want to do that. Um, but it's a possibility if uh, political forces had forced them into trying uh, because at the time well kind of again force said people hadn't quite gotten on to just how powerful air attack could have been david fryboth asks how did the major navy shipyards stack up during the battleship era uh, 1900 to 1945 well a lot of this comes down to efficiency and experience and that's coupled along with the ancillary industries associated with battleship building, so armour foundries, gun foundries, etc, etc, um, that we've discussed in uh, some previous episodes. 
Now, for the bulk of this period, the shipyards that were by far and away the best were the British shipyards. And that was purely due to the fact that the British Empire built so many warships and for itself and also uh, foreign orders for others. They just had by far the most experience and because they had that really high throughput of uh, number of ships being requested to be built, they also had the most shipyards um, at both in terms of absolute numbers and also in terms of the larger shipyards that could actually build battleships. Um, the Jane's Fighting Ships uh, books for those periods are actually really helpful because right at the start of each nation they actually go over all the naval bases and all the various dry docks and shipyards uh, that the uh, various nations possess and when you start looking through that you realize just how many shipyards uh, the British had and obviously the industry to support all of that and with all that experience they were able to turn ships out ridiculously fast that's why the dreadnought despite being started slightly later than some other uh, sort of first generation dreadnoughts completed so quickly got into the water and was out and about before anyone else uh, had even launched. Now the other three nations probably that had major shipyards during the bulk of this period uh, were America, France and Germany. Uh, the French shipyards were kind of on a bit of a decline as the French Navy became smaller and smaller, although they did have a few fairly large shipyards, including some of the largest in the world um, in terms of individual docks. So there's that. The German shipyards uh, were very up and coming, very modern. Um, they had limited capacity uh, just because building shipyards and all that ancillary industry takes an awful lot of time. Um, but obviously we can see from the run-up to World War One what they were capable of. Um, they obviously took a major hit after World War One on the account of Germany losing the war and then kind of built themselves back up again under Nazi rule. Um, so they were always kind of yards that were relatively efficient had fairly large slipways, but just never had the sheer numbers of yards uh, or the total experience to be able to turn out lots of ships very quickly. The American shipyards are another matter entirely. So at the start of this period, 1900, the American shipyards were well behind. Um, French, Germany uh, and Britain all could easily outbuild them and their construction time was quite long but unlike everybody else's shipyards the american shipyards just sort of tended to go up and up from strength to strength partly helped by all the money people were throwing at them during world war one um so at first american shipyards became more numerous and then they would gradually become more efficient during world war one they were still less efficient than british yards um, and then at some point in the interwar period, they began to catch up. And then when you got to World War II, you had the absolutely ridiculous output that many American yards demonstrated, both in terms of constructing things like Liberty ships and actual warships themselves, and became sort of almost industrial line output for mass numbers of ships in a very short amount of time. The Japanese shipyards similarly... Um, but on a much smaller scale. They weren't too badly affected uh, by the end of World War I. Um, they tended more towards the sort of uh, very handcrafted <laughs> type of approach, almost because they just didn't have the sheer numbers that Britain or America did. Um, so they kind of just wandered their way along. They were always hampered by the Japanese lack of uh, resources. And, of course, in the 1920s, being hit by a massive earthquake didn't help them either. The British shipyards... Um, wrapping this bit up obviously went into a bit of a decline in the 1920s they didn't have many foreign orders uh, they didn't have anywhere near as many orders for the British Navy and this kind of specialized industry really atrophies without constant orders coming through um, and so by the time you got to World War II you kind of had the British shipyards although they retained a degree of their efficiency um, their sheer capacity was just gradually going into a decline whilst the American shipyards were coming back up and then they kind of crossed over at some point. Uh, as I say, the British shipyards still remained very, very good at what they did. There just weren't enough of them left in business to sustain the kind of mass building effort um, that was necessary, which is why a lot of things like refits and uh, in some cases even building got uh, parceled out to American shipyards that were just there in vastly larger numbers by World War II. Shoot Me says, uh, you all say guns are the longest build item for battleships. What goes into their construction? 
Well, the answer there is an awful lot. Now, there are two main ways of building a large caliber naval gun uh, for a battleship and a number of ancillary related ways, but just to briefly cover those. So you've got the tube method, which basically involves constructing a number of uh, large metal tubes, surprisingly enough, and they kind of stack inside one of e each other and you fit them together, weld them together, etc. until then you have a gun and then you go through the gun finishing process, which we'll get onto in a minute. And then you have the wire wound method, which as the name suggests, involves taking an initial tube, your inner tube, and then the rest of the gun is largely built up by winding large amounts of wire, steel wire around it, forging it, doing it again, blah, 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 and then you get an outer tube as well. Now, each method has its own strengths and weaknesses, um, but broadly speaking, let's go into, into a bit more detail about how you actually build the thing. So the main reason that gun construction took so long was the sheer amount of accuracy that was necessary uh, in order for the gun not to just explode the minute you fired it. Um, and bear in mind, this is in an era well before computers, electronics and everything, so everything is being done mechanically and by hand. So to briefly outline how a wire-wound gun was constructed, so first you need to forge three pieces out of a nickel-chromium steel alloy. That's your inner tube, your outer tube, and the cover that is the external uh, covering of the gun. And that really is basically just a weather cover. The outer and inner tubes are the main functional parts of the actual gun itself. Now, first you have to forge these things. So you're talking about very large uh, lumps of metal that have to be sort of big cylinders. And then you bore the initial hole in the inner tube and obviously the outer tube as well. The outer tube is then heated, and this again shows you how precise it has to be, because the outer tube won't actually fit the inner tube as it's bored. You heat it to make it expand, and you then pop it over the inner tube, and it's then shrunk fit on the inner tube. Now obviously if you bore the hole out fractionally too small, it's just going to crush the inner tube. If you bore it out fractionally too large, it's not going to fit. It's just going to sort of sit around there loosely. So this kind of extremely fine grade drilling process through something that's sort of several dozen feet of uh, very hard nickel chromium steel takes a little while to do and get right. You now have about 100 miles of quarter inch steel wire and you need to wrap this around and around and around your completed outer and inner tube piece. Now, as you might imagine, getting this right and getting this also similarly precise takes an awful long time. And the purpose of this is basically to help uh, cope with recoil and uh, expansion of the gun during firing. You then have to heat up the cover tube and that is then heat shrunk over the wire in the same way that the outer tube was shrunk over the inner tube. So again, extremely fine tolerances and you have to heat the thing very nice and evenly, which is again a big challenge with something at that size. But you're not finished there because now you have a finished gun, but you still have to cut the final hole for the bore because that first uh, drilling was just your initial hole. So again, you now have forged hardened chromium nickel steel and you've now got to bore a perfectly straight perfectly uh, aligned uh, tunnel hole all the way through it to enable you to actually fire shells out of it and if you thought that was bad enough your final process is the rifling now bear in mind again you now have your hardened forged nickel chromium steel uh, gun barrel, you've just bored it out, it's all nice and straight, and you've now got to cut the rifling through this incredibly hardened steel, and you've got to get it exactly right. Now, t drilling through it is a doddle compared to this, because drilling through it, you've just got to keep in a straight line with one big circle, uh, circular cutting uh, device. Whereas with the rifling grooves, you've not only got to cut numerous rifling grooves, you've got to keep them uh, all spaced at the right spacing. You've got to keep the twist going at exactly the right twist, and you've got to cut do all this through incredibly hard forged steel. Um, the rifling needs to be machined to a tolerance of within one ten thousandth of an inch, so that's thinner than a uh, human hair. Otherwise, your shell is going to either be wildly inaccurate at best, or jam and explode at worst. Oh, and did I mention that once you've started this process, 
it can't stop because uh, just taking the tools out and then resetting them later on will introduce an error that is uh, too substantial. This drilling process for the rifling usually took about a year on its own. Uh, it really pushed the absolute limit of technology available at the time. So yeah, that is a, a very brief description of how you make a battleship gun using the wire wound method and hopefully that gives you some idea of why it just took so long to make them uh, bear in mind if you got it wrong at any point you had to go back and start again and you had to make multiple gun barrels it wasn't just a case of oh we need uh, nine guns for three triple turrets it was a case of right well we've got a ship that has nine guns and three triple turrets you need something like 20 barrels for when the guns wear out now, I'm aware that this particular episode has answered fewer questions, um, but I basically saved a lot of questions that needed longer answers and tried to get them all in in uh, one episode of the Dry Dock, so hopefully we can resume the normal number of questions answered per episode uh, next week. So, the final question for this week's episode, um, Peter Jorgensen asks... After the Battle of Jutland, the German Navy stayed in port and there were no more large engagements. Were they really that outnumbered and beaten that they could make no more contribution to the war? Uh, were there no strategic moves left for such a big asset? Well, um, elements of the High Seas Fleet did play, take part in some fairly major operations against the Baltic uh, Russian Navy during the latter part of the First World War, so there was that. Um, various formations, mostly uh, sort of squadrons of battle cruisers, also tried to do raids on uh, British North Sea convoys and the like, with a certain degree of success in the latter half of the war. But no, the, the bulk of the High Seas Fleet didn't, obviously, as you say, come out uh, after the Battle of Jutland. And a lot of this has to do with the outcome of the Battle of Jutland. Now, one thing was the loss of the Pomerne convinced the Germans, if they had needed any further convincing before, that pre-dreadnoughts just did not have a role in the line of battle. And that deleted an entire battle squadron off the strength of the German Navy uh, frontline units immediately, which uh, put their numbers at even more of a disadvantage by displacement and number of guns. Secondly was that with the Royal Navy blockade and the uh, continuing struggles on the Western Front, the German Navy became less and less of a priority, and so ships weren't being uh, completed as quickly, whereas uh, the British, although they weren't building any new ships, were still uh, rolling out ships that were under construction at the start of the war. And a lot of it was simply to just do with the actual outcome of Jutland itself. Now, obviously, at Jutland, the British lost more ships. But surprisingly enough, actually, in terms of actual strength and numbers, the next day, the British fleet was basically back up to near enough the same strength it had been before the battle uh, through a combination of ships coming out of refit and new ships being completed and ships that had been left behind coming back out and also the fact that actually outside of the ships that had been lost there weren't actually that many uh, capital ships that had been damaged in terms of battleships you were basically looking at war spite uh, and Malaya as having taken heavy damage. Marlborough had taken a little bit of damage as well. But outside of that, and uh, Colossus being hit a couple of times by shellfire that didn't do an awful lot of damage, that was basically it for the damage to the actual British battleship line. And you had ships like the Queen Elizabeth that just sort of sauntered out of dock. And so, as I say, by the next day, the British battle line was basically back up to full strength. Uh, the battle cruisers slightly less so because obviously they'd lost three of them. Lion and Tiger had been quite heavily hit as well. Um, Princess Royal had taken a few hits, um, but at the same time you did have HMAS Australia, which could have been called it up in back into home waters in an emergency. You had Renown and Repulse that were in the process of commissioning, and in addition to HMS Queen Elizabeth. You also had Emperor of India and Dreadnought, which could be brought back in, along with the brand new Royal Sovereign. So, yeah. 
Conversely, the day after, no German battle cruiser was in a serviceable state, and uh, quite a number of them wouldn't be for several months, obviously Seydlitz being the one that needed the most repairs. Uh, but a number of German battleships had also taken a bit of a battering and were also under repair. So this badly diminished the strength of the German fleet, especially with effectively the uh, knocking out of the entire first scouting group, which meant that by the time the German ships were repaired and kind of, therefore the high seas fleet had effectively just come back up to its regular strength, um, most of the damage to the various British ships had been repaired. So you had all those ships that had just come back out of refit who had missed the battle, plus the ones that had been damaged in the battle. So British numerical superiority in the immediate aftermath of Jutland uh, remained uh, actually higher than it had been before uh, due to the, uh, the damage taken to the German ships. And then once uh, both sides had repaired their damage, uh, you had this slowing of the German uh, wartime uh, shipbuilding industry and the increase in British numbers from things like the R-Class, Renown and Repulse, etc. coming online. And the final nail in the coffin, as it were, for any German ambitions to try and challenge the uh, Grand Fleet was the fact that in 1917, with America entering the war, you had a squadron of American battleships showing up, which just added even more to the uh, overall Grand Fleet's uh, numerical superiority. And although those ships had at severe accuracy uh, gunnery issues at first, they trained with the Grand Fleet and began to solve those. So with the uh, small number of German ships that were added to sort of the Bayerns, uh, Hindenburg, things like that, it just wasn't enough. And uh, the Germans realised this. Uh, they realised that had basically been their chance. Uh, they hadn't managed to quite pull it off. And the ultimate vote, obviously, was the German crew when, in 1918, they were ordered to just go out and sail and fight the Grand Fleet to try and uh, make a difference to the Germans. In terms of surrender, they realised it was a suicide mission and just walked out. So, yeah, that is the long question answer format uh, for the dry dock. We will get back, as I say, to answering a few more of everybody's questions next week. Hope you've enjoyed this week, and we'll see you again later.